Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Heavenly Father, we lift up our voice in worship to you, Lord, for you are so awesome. You reign on high and we adore you. Today we pour out our hearts to you for a special outpouring of your blessings upon the lives of our children. We pray that they will walk in righteousness and see new opportunities floating their hearts and minds as you guide them. And you lead them, Lord, as you do it. We pray that rivers of living water will flow through them, exposing the, the awesome wonder of who you really are. Beshem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Shalom, shalom. Well, to this morning, you are the champions. Because of the cold weather, you all came in. I don't know if you remember uh, last year at this time, uh, it was colder and we didn't have any heat. And we went downstairs, right? Joseph reminded me of, of this. It was great. You know, it was very uh, nice to be together, you know, uh, all downstairs. Now, something else, you know, I'd like to, to thank really the people in the kitchen, all the work that they're doing. Last week it was our sisters, the Filipinos, they did some great work. And also, uh, Mariella, Maria, is she here? No, she's in the kitchen. You know what? When you go downstairs, look for Mariella and thank her. She's always there every week, you know, calling Sharon, what should I do, and so on and so forth. So these are great work that they're doing. So let's open up our scriptures to 1 Samuel chapter 20. You know, one question which hovers over this section of the, the, the first book of Samuel is, can we ask God for blessings when we're not following him? Can we? Should we expect him to answer our prayers, to look after us when, when we're not walking the proper way with him? When we transgress, even, even the smallest of his laws and his words. Can we do that? Logically, the answer is no. No. But we learn here that we have a wonderful God who never forsakes his own. While the blessings will not flow as they would when one walks the right path, he nevertheless will always watch after his people. This is what we are about to look in the life of David. In this new section of Samuel, the young and powerful David who fought Goliath with just a sling and a stone, it's, he's not the same. He's not. Here we find him anxious and sure. He fears for his life. Even John, Jonathan, his good friend, tried to again and again to reassure him. He reminds him that he's the true king of Israel and that he could not die for his destined to sit on the throne. But you know what? Nothing works. David has become introvert. His problems took over his life. He's consumed with himself. Here we do not read these beautiful words repeated many times in the previous chapter. And the Lord was with David. As if God took the back seat. It is a drastic change from those previous chapters. What happened? We're not told actually what brought David to this state, but this introversion, this self-centeredness brings him to do things actually hard to believe. From chapter 20 to the end of the book, chapter 31, it is a catalog of infractions, of errors, of misjudgment. It seems that all the demons have woken up. It seems that they did not take the fall of Goliath very well. And again, through this confusion, there's one truly beautiful thing. One bright ray of, of light. While at first God seems to be so distant, he's nevertheless so present. Always coming to the rescue. And very often at the last second. And so there's much suspense, by the way, in these stories. The title of this study is Saving David. Saving David from the constant attempt on his life. Saving David from himself as well. Why, why do you think it's important for God to save David? By saving David, God saved us all. Because from David came Jesus, Yeshua, who came to bring salvation to all men. From the line of David came the Messiah, who like Isaiah the prophet said, He has borne our griefs. Our, and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. That is why God saved David, so that we may have this salvation today. And there is something here. And, and this section is so definitely, by the way, practical 
Okay? And it's not always easy to read. The events, the chronology do not always make sense. Some of David's and Jonathan's and Saul's action will raise our eyebrows. And the reader will all find the, the need to go back to the previous section to try to make sense of the subsequent ones. But there's a powerful message in the way this is presented to us. Perhaps the Holy Spirit of God who inspired every single word of the Bible purposely presents this text in this manner so we realize that when sin reigns, life doesn't make sense anymore. Where there's lawlessness, there's no harmony. In the overall, then, the text actually, I want to tell you, makes perfect sense. In that first Samuel is like a powerful mirror. Like, like a lover at the temple, there's a large, this is a large basin, you know, used for ceremonial cleansing at the temple, situated just before one enters the presence of God in the holy place. We're told that the, this lover was made for, from the bronze mirrors of the woman. So the priests were looking at themselves as they washed themselves before they enter the presence of God. This is like Samuel. Samuel is that huge lover where we can see ourselves. And so it is my prayer that today that this powerful text will bless us and help us to go back to God, who's always there, always there for us. Now let's begin to look at the first verse, chapter 20, verse 1. Then David fled to Naioth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? David opening statement are those type of existential question we often ask God. They set the stage, by the way, for the rest of the book. What, what have I done? What is my iniquity? This reminds us of Job, do you remember, who asked the very same questions. It is true that in both cases... Job and David were being persecuted for things they were innocent of. Job's three friends were literally and constantly harassing him and trying to make him lose his stability and faith in God. And Saul is doing the same thing to David. From our perspective, they were both great men. But were they innocent? Were they blameless, guiltless in the eyes of God? Can we ask us a question as when we address God? This is such, I want to tell you, it's such a timely question, especially when we consider that this is the beginning of the life of David and that he is very much the foundational stone leading to Yeshua, whose name is salvation. And the key entrance to the presence of God is to realize that, yes, we are sinners. In this opening statement... This statement tells us that something had happened in David's mind. That he came to think himself actually so highly. Later, I believe, after all these trials about, we're about to look into, David answers his own questions. If you remember in Psalm 14, he says, There's no one who does good. No, not one. This is, by the way, the entrance to salvation. No, there is none who is righteous, not even the great David Amalekh, the great one. To Job, God himself answered him, for he thought he was righteous in the eyes of God as well. Through his book, he asked to meet, to meet God, if you remember, to see him so he could please his case. At the end, God meets Job. This must have been the moment Job learned to be careful of the things actually we pray for. This is when God comes to him and in turn asks him 77 powerful questions no man could answer or challenge. Question about the creation, about the universe, about the eternity. And the first one, he says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? This is God who speaks to man. Who is calling me to argue, he says. Who is the one who said, what I have done, what is my iniquity? And this is when, when the series of questions are asked, Job, and asked to every man. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, God says, chapter 38, verse 4 of Job. Who has put wisdom in the mind and who has given understanding to the heart? Tell me, God says to man, if you have understanding. Tell me if you know all this. And God says, who has preceded me that I should pay him? 
There's no beginning nor end to God. Nobody created God. He always was. He was, he is, and he will always be. Can a finite, finite mind actually challenge the creator? This is in front of whom Job and David argued about their innocence. They had no chance at all, of course. After the 77 question, Job looked for a place to hide and he couldn't. And this is what he says, therefore I bore myself in and repent in dust and ashes. And David as well, in Psalm 51. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions after all these ordeals. Hide your face from my sins and blow out all my iniquities. This is when God took them and healed them and poured on them great heavenly riches. See, repentance works wonder. Now, in many ways, the coming section of Samuel is like, and the whole book, by the way, is like the book of Job. It answers two questions. What have I done? What is my iniquity? And David goes even further in that he gives this answer in many messianic psalms and prophecy. He must have written when he was going through these, these trials, by the way. What I have done, what is my iniquity, will not hold in the divine court. But this is why the Messiah came. Now let's keep on reading. This is when we meet another side of David, or deeply that is. And the Spirit puts a great emphasis, a great emphasis on the change because to whom much is given, much is required. At this point, in verse 2, David's faith had dwindled somehow, right? He panics, he is even tormented by the possibility of being killed. He says at the end of verse 3, he says, There's hardly a step between me and death. But there was none at all. Not at all, because God protected him. He had to be king of Israel. He was just anointed by God to be king of Israel, and he experienced such a great miracle with Goliath. What happened to all this that he forgot? It's very much like us today. We experience great things with God, and when a trial comes, we say, there's hardly a step between me and death. I'm going to die, right? And Jonathan, like a good friend, tries to comfort him and reason with him. His first words are, by no means you're going to die, David. And we see him trying all different ways to reassure him. In verse 9, he tells him, For if I should indeed learn that evil had been decided by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you about it? Have you forgotten I'm your friend? David was afraid that Jonathan will take Saul's side. He began to lose his trust, even in his good friend. This is what happens when we become introverted and so busy with ourselves. We, we don't trust God, and much less our friends. Jonathan even swears. In verse 12, he says, The Lord, the God of Israel, be a witness that I am your friend. In many ways, he tries to remind David that he will be king in Israel, for God promised it. He even asked David to be good to him when This happens, right? He tries to bring him to live the promise. Look at verse 14, what he says. If I'm still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? That is wise, by the way, from Jonathan. While David fears for his life, he brings him in the future and asks him to save him. As if he was to say, I'm the one who should worry because you're the one who's going to be a king. Are you going to save my life, right? Jonathan is also a friend, by the way. Don't we need to be reminded that God will never forsake us or leave us? And Jonathan, who who was the son of the current king, and next to be one, goes as far as making a covenant with the whole house of David. In verse 16, he says, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Me, the Lord, required it at the hands of David's enemies. The house of David, only here, by the way, in Samuel, in the book of Samuel. These words which stem from a deep belief in the scriptures, Jonathan tried his utmost to bring back David to his senses. But as the text reveals, they both actually at the end went down. Both of them. Jonathan understood better than David, but as the text goes on, instead of David following Jonathan, the latter oversteps the boundaries of friendship and followed David into sin. At some point, Jonathan told David, whatever you say I will do, verse 4. And he did, and both engaged in the slope of lies. 
Friendship does not mean that one follows or helps his friends by resorting to illegalities, by doing things against God. True friendship, like true love, can be and should be tough. See now what happens. David wanted to know if Saul was seeking to kill him. We have seen that Saul's temperament changed without warning, so David was worried. So he devised a plan to find out. It was Rosh Chodesh, right? Chodesh in Hebrew means new moon. And it was a time of rest, a Shabbat for all Israel to gather for a communal meal or family, by family that is. However, at this time, they did not know when the new moon would fall exactly. So they had one, two or three days of festivities until they were sure they fulfilled the commandment of Rosh Chodesh. For Rosh Chodesh is only one day. So as David was to celebrate it with Saul, see the plan he devised. Okay, This is where we see the first of many transgressions. Try to spot it, right? Verse 5 and 6. It says, And David said to Jonathan, Indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. But let me go, that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly ask permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice for all the family. Where's the iniquity here? Did you spot it? it? It may not be big enough in our eyes, but big enough in the eyes of God. It is true that it was a yearly sacrifice for all the family, but was it, it wasn't true that David had any intention of going to Bethlehem. And he didn't go. And he lied. He lied. Well, some will argue, well, this is a white lie. It's small, okay? If needed, you know, he needed to find an excuse to protect himself, and it was given to Saul, actually, who actually didn't deserve any better. And while lie is usually understood, this white lie is usually understood to be a trivial, a mundane lie, it is defined as a lie. It is a lie with good intention, they say. Okay? But there's no such thing as a lie with good intention. When Yeshua said that the devil himself is a liar and the father of it all, he never made a distinction between small or big lie. The problem is that we often assume that a lie is the only way one could get around the problem. Evil should never be an option for those who walk with God. A lie, whether white or huge, is a lie. And then when one begins to resort to what God calls sin to get his way, the person should not expect God to support him. This is what we're going to see from here till the end of chapter 31. The rest of the story, the next 12 chapters and beyond, will show us that our holy God cannot be asked to partner with someone who's, who willingly sins. Maybe we should define sin, by the way, as God sees it. There's a very simple definition, 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The Bible does not contain many definitions, by the way, about, uh, about sin, except to say that sin is a violation of careless disregard of God's law. And the word used for lawlessness is anomia, nomos, is law, by the way, in Greek. So they are without nomos, without law. Greek scholars understand nomos, the law, to mean what is proper, what is just, what is right to do. It comes to be applied to any norm, rule or custom or tradition. There is nothing like sin to ask God to live, by the way. But sin has a way to creep and slide in like a snake and take over our senses of judgment. This is what we have to catch it at its inception. You know, I read about John and Charles Wesley, who were some of the greatest evangelists in history, and what helped them to be so successful was surely their mother, their mother, Susanna Wesley. Mothers have such a great influence, they can often have a great influence on their children, even in the adult age, by the way. Susanna Wesley came up with a practical definition of sin, very practical, something we should learn, we should apply. She said, whatever weakens our reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, and takes off the relish of spiritual things when you don't want to read the Bible, when you don't want to pray anymore, 
That is sin, she says. That, that is a great gauge to spot sin in our life. Once we begin to see life differently from the way God sees it, it is surely because sin is trying to take over our minds, our lives. And this must have been David's case here. At the end, Saul did not even believe Jonathan, nor David. In fact, he got so mad at Jonathan for having given him such a lame reason for David. Look at verse 30. He goes out of his mind. The moment he realized that Jonathan was lying, he says, Then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan, and he said to me, You son of a pervert, rebellious woman, do I know, not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness, right? Whoa. See, see how sin awakens the worst of man, right? This is when Saul tried to kill him. In verse 3, he took a, a, a spear and he threw it at him. This is when God is not in the picture anymore. In fact, he is nowhere to be found in the next chapter and in this chapter. But why did Jonathan follow David in accepting lie? Well, what do you think? You know, he was so into the word of God. It seems to be so much on top of things. He understood so much. You know the reason why? Because sin is contagious. This is why Paul is out of himself when he deals with sin. He knew it. He knew he has a potential of destroying an individual, even a congregation. Even the secular world, by the way, realized that things like sin is contagious. You know, a fairly new study done in 2010 showed that things like divorce, for instance, is contagious. And spread through the family, friends and co-workers. The results of this particular study, which included 1,200 people, began back in 1948. So they followed the people. It indicates people are 75% more likely to be divorced if someone they are di directly connected get divorced. Right? This is why we need to stick together as believers. Listen to one of the primary researchers said. He said, people often respond to social behavior like they would to a virus. This is why they say your friends are a statement of who you are or you to, who, who actually you're choosing to become. Jonathan wanted to please David so much that he followed him and to sin. Sin is contagious and is also progressive. If not dealt with, it grows. And if you think that David's first lie is somehow bad, wait till you see the next one. This is nothing really. This is nothing. In the next chapter 21 verses 1 and 2, as David is running away from Saul, he's actually tired. He's hungry. And so he goes to visit the high priest Ahimelech. See what it says, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 says, And now David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, What? Are you alone? Why are you alone? And no one is with you. And verse 2 says, So David said to Ahimelech, the priest, The king has ordered me on some business and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you, and what I have commanded you. So David told Ahimelech, the king has ordered me on some business. No, he didn't. He did not. Nor Saul, nor God, if one would like to read God as the king, none ordered him on some business here. And from then on, the story goes on a rapid downfall. Ahimelech provides David with food and weapons, for, for David told him that he was... Actually, in a hurry, so he forgot to take his weapons. I think that Ahimelech began to suspect something. How can a soldier forget his weapons? And see who was there and who witnessed everything. Doeg the Edomite. The first of many enemies who actually rose against Israel. From here to, first, to chapter 31. He later told Saul, who came, actually, Saul came to, and he killed Ahimelech. You know how many else, how many people he killed? Actually, he killed 85 priests in Israel. At the time of the tragedy, Saul asked his soldiers to kill the priests, and they refused. They said, no, we cannot kill the people of God. In chapter 22, 17, actually, and 18, he turns to Doeg, and he says, you do that. And he did that. And he killed them all. He was an Edomite who did this. 
By the way, this is considered one of the darkest moments in the history of the nation. And it all started with a lie. And David realized that he was responsible for this death. For in verse 22, he says, I have caused the death of so many people. It was actually all man-made. At this point, does anyone have the right to ask God, like, where is God when things happen like this? Does he have the right, does God have the right not to answer? Can we finally understand God's silence sometimes when tragedy occurs? It is here in the original Hebrew, by the way, when the Spirit of God changes the name of Doeg the Edomite. This is beautiful. You know, here in verse 18, okay, where Doeg kills 85 person, and in verse 22, when David finds out that it was Doeg who killed all of them, the name Doeg is written, as you see it in the screen, Dalet Aleph Gimel, D-E-G, right? But in verse 18 and 22, the Spirit changed the spelling, okay? He removed the Aleph, okay, and he put a Vav and a Yud. Why does he do that? And only here. And without changing the pronunciation, why the change? The two added letters with the Aleph, right, spell Wo or Oi in Hebrew. An expression of despair, of lamentation, as if heaven was crying with earth for, for the death of 85 priests of God. It is, by the way, beautiful to see these changes in the original text. They often tell us that what, what the Lord thinks, how he is so affected by the situations here on earth. You know, every sin affects God. David said it in Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned. Now, what David did right after he got food and a weapon from Ahimelech is actually out of this world. The weapon that Ahimelech gave him was actually Goliath's sword, which was kept at the tabernacle. But see where he goes. This is where it becomes incomprehensible. First Samuel 21.10 Then David rose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Ahish, the king of Gath. Okay, do you find something wrong there? Gath is Goliath's hometown. And so he goes there with Goliath's sword to ask for help. Does it make sense? Do you understand that? Did he expect the Philistines to offer refuge for him? To protect him? This is the case of when one puts his head into the lion's mouth. And he fast, fast realizes his mistake. And as he tries to get out of the situation, he does something you would not believe he would ever do. Look at verse 13. So he changed his behavior before them, feigned madness in their hearts, scratched the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. This is King David. This is when he was a step away from death. He acted this way for he knew that he was going to die, that he was going to be killed. And this is when God, I believe, comes into action. For David couldn't, could have died right there. He did not have any children yet. So God protected him. Somehow, the king changed his mind and he lets him go. Okay? This is when a miracle happened. Somehow the king of the Philistine, which I believe means angry, Achish means angry, changes his mind and lets David go. But yet he knew David was. He called him the king of the land. He knew the history. He even knew the song of the woman in verse 11. Saul has slain his thousand and David his ten thousand. Yet in some wonderful way, he lets him go. And we know that it is God who came to the rescue. Just like he did with Abraham. Do you remember? Do you know that Abraham went to the same place? Same place. When he lied about his wife, Sarah. Right? And then... Actually, he was saved as well, because Sarah carried the seed of, actually, the Messiah. Now we can ask the question, why are we having a story like this? Well, why so many details? And there are so many, actually, in there. This is King David, the man after God's heart, who lied twice, who acted like a madman. And this is only the beginning of a long list. What do we do with this information? One first practical lesson we learn here is that if David fell, who are you to think you won't fall? That's the question. Paul understood this. He understood it so well, and he puts it another way. He says, for I am weak, I am strong. Right? What did he mean by this? 
He surely read the story of David and realized that when we recognize our, our frailty, our weaknesses, then we realize that we are we, when we are weak, this is when God comes and makes us strong. David easily, you know, put down Goliath. But he has such a hard time with a white lie. You see how sin can creep in? When Balaam could not curse the Israelites, you know what he did? He went in the camp and suddenly actually caused so much damage. This is how evil operates. Big sin we can handle, right? We can see them and fight them. It's when they come from the back that we have to be careful. If we think we are strong by ourselves, we'll end up at the door of the Philistines. But when we put on the armor of God, this is when we become strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. This is what it is. Now the second thing we can see is that we need a mediator. We need a savior. We need a Messiah. This is what Samuel tells us. A sinless, spotless Messiah who never, ever sinned. So he can save us. David could not save Israel. He could not. No one could, by the way. Only Yeshua can, for he is the Messiah. The life of David begs us to look for a mediator. It begs us to do that. So let us not say like this prominent member of a congregation when he was once arrested driving under the influence of alcohol. You know, the policeman recognized him for he was going actually to the same congregation. So he asked how could he do such a thing and when he saw the brown bag next to the man, he asked, what is that bottle in the brown bag? So he reached in and took the bottle and smelled it and he says, John, that's wine. So John then said, it is, how wonderful, the Lord has done it again. Do you get that? Let's not find excuses, that's the point. Think about it. <laughs> and through, by the way, this confusion, we read from here to the, the, very much the end of the book, we see that God has a wonderful way, by the way, to turn such a situation into a blessing. He does. I, I give you really the bad part of it, but there's something really beautiful in there. There's a third point to consider in this book. We read again, by the way, towards the beginning of the next book. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. After all this, God waited for him. Even later, 2,000 years later, all this was forgotten. And David's name among, is written among the great people of faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 32, what, what the author says, he says, it would tell, him, it would tell me to, to, to tell you everything that David did, every good things. What does that teach us? Look at the person in the way God sees them, always in a good way. And the Lord was always with him. He never left them by himself throughout all this ordeal. Well, when you gather all, all these things that he has done, you know, as a, as a believer, and how God was with him, you actually feel secure. We have seen how he protected David from Achish. He even allowed Achimelech to give him the sacred bread of David, a bread that only the priest could eat, because Achimelech asked God before. And he agreed. Later, Jesus himself quotes this passage we're going to see next time. Later in the next in the text, God even sends a prophet, Gad, okay, to warn David of enemies. Three times, David asked God, by the way, and God answers, short answers, but he answered him. And throughout the text, a greater thing happens, much greater. God transformed this sad situation into great blessings for all believers from all times, even if until today. How is that? It was during this difficult situation that David wrote so many psalms that we use today to find God and to find protection in God. It was during these difficult periods of time that David, in his suffering, also wrote the messianic psalms, which are prophecies of the first coming of the Messiah, some of the greatest you find in the scriptures. It was when Saul, and for over ten years, pursued David to kill him, that David was at the right stage to write one of the most powerful psalms about Jesus. To mention just a few in closing. 
David pronounced the same words that Yeshua pronounced on the cross, on the tithe. And he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeshua pronounced these words after being nailed on the cross for six hours. And at the very same time, the last Passover lamb was sacrificed. So was the Messiah. And he says, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. This is when he carried all the sins. And that is the Messiah. And for the first and last time in eternity, he was separated, severed from the Father. By the way, I dare not venture into these words beyond what is written. But enough is given to us here so to perceive the great rupture. When holiness allowed darkness to submerge him for a moment so that we may be saved. And in Psalm 22 verse 16, David in his despair and suffering prophesied the manner of death of the Messiah. They pierced my hand and my feet just like the manner Jesus was crucified. And just before, it describes the manner of death of that is one when, when one is on the cross. He says... My strength is dried up like a pot chair, and my tongue clings to my jaws. This is what happens when we are on the cross. David, the Spirit of God, told all these things to David because he was suffering so much at this point. You know, many rabbinical commentators have seen the power behind these words and attributed them to the Messiah. In one book, by the way, called the Pesikta Rabati of Rabbi Kahana, written about the 5th century after Jesus, you know, in a section about the Messiah, the writer quotes Psalm 22, 16. He says, because of their sin, your tongue will stick to the roof of your mouth. And then he addresses the Messiah and says, are you willing to endure it for us? To this, the Messiah responds to him and says, yes, I am and I'm coming to endure it. Amen. And the other parts, the same thing, some Jewish commentators saw the rejection of the Messiah in Psalm 22, 7. When it says, and all those who see me ridicule me. It's true. When Jesus was on the cross, they were making fun of him. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him. Since he delights in him. On this part... This book, there's some rabbis they wrote, For the sake of Israel, you, the Messiah, experienced anguish, derision, and mockery. They understood that these Psalms were messianic. This is Rabbat, Pesikta Rabbati 37 two. See that some of their own sages recognize the power of this prophecy. No one can affirm that in Judaism, that Psalm 22 is not a messianic psalm. And see what else, by the way, the Spirit inspired David to write... They divide my garment among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Chapter 22, 18. But this is exactly what happened. Actually when they. With Jesus that is. We can see this in Matthew 27, 35. And see how the Lord can turn a sad situation. A difficult situation. Into a blessing for us today. David may not have understood what he was writing. Perhaps he must have realized. That these words went beyond his own suffering. Maybe this is why he wrote Psalm 119, where he loves the Word of God. He saw the power of the Word of God as he was inspired to write all these things. And there are other Psalms which prophesy the Messiah. Another one, Psalm 16, speaks of the resurrection of the Messiah. He says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus' body did not see any corruption, for he resurrected on the third day, the law in the Mishnah says that a man can be deemed dead only after the third day. That is on the fourth day. They couldn't find Jesus because he resurrected. In the fam famous Psalm 119, part of the Hallel that we sing, David says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstones. Yet, they rejected David, yes, after he was anointed as king of Israel. But David was not the chief cornerstones. Now he cannot be. And he must have realized it. For he wrote this. He says, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. How could the king of kings, the Messiah, the chief cornerstone be despised and rejected? This is his question. A cornerstone, by the way, by definition, is a foundation stone. It is the first stone set in the construction of a building. It is important since all other stone will, will set in reference to this stone, which determine each other's position, right? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. 
right? He is what Paul says, for no other foundation, he says, can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, Yeshua Mashiach. You know, there's much more in this text we'll see next time. Let us conclude. You know, if someone, if you know someone who's living in sin and does not realize it or does not want to realize it, have him read 1 Samuel chapter 20 to 31. They'll come back to you and say, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. And then you answer, well, this is your life. This is what it is. This is a mirror. And then you can lead them to see how God actually is present. We can see it maybe at first reading. How God is present after every verse. And you can lead them to see the messianic prophecies. How Jesus himself, that is how David himself, brought out the solution as he was suffering. Today we have seen how a seemingly insignificant lie okay, led to another. And how it triggered a chain of unfortunate event which lasted actually so many years. Big sins actually are easy to catch. It is those small, subtle ones the scriptures ask us to look for. We have seen also how the Lord can turn a bad situation into a glorious one. God always sees the best of everyone. This we see it over and over. He could have fired David right there and then and get somebody else. But he knew his heart. Even when David was doing the wrong things, right? You know, I read this week, in closing again, this week, a part of the history of Christopher Columbus. You know, it was, you know, I realized this. It was on the 3rd of August, actually, in 1492, that he sailed uh, toward the West to discover the Americas. But the same year, did you know, in 1492, in January the 2nd, that Arabs actually surrounded to Queen uh, Isabella of Spain. And, and she strengthened the Spanish Inquisition, which asked Jews and Arabs to convert to Catholicism or face deportation or death. The Arabs actually had a place to go, but the Jews didn't. For Europe actually had closed its doors at that time. However, see that in the same year, Christopher Columbus opened the Americas where many of the Jews found refuge. But there's an irony. This is what I want to bring you. There's an irony with Christopher Columbus. On his first voyage, he knew that his crew felt uneasy about sailing into unknown waters for an unknown period of time. He really did not know what, what really was going and how long it will take. So he kept two logs for the journey. In the first, he recorded the distances traveled as he calculated them. In the second log, he deliberately entered shorter distances so his crew would think that they were closer to home than they actually were. This deception, this lie, had an ironic twist. As it turns out, the phony mileage figures Columbus entered to soothe his nervous crew were more accurate than his real calculations. His lies had been closer to the mark than his truth. This also, I believe, is God's doing. Who anywhere and everywhere, he is present to protect his people. Columbus did not have much time to find the land for the people of God and who were actually being persecuted. But he found it fast and at the right time. So all the Jews could, most of the Jews could go to the Americas at that time. Let's bow ahead in prayer. Now to us, from him who is and who was and who is to come, from Yeshua Mashiach, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now may God grant us such that we may say like David, you are my hiding place. You protect me from all trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance so that our work is produced by faith and by love so that we can always uplift the name of Yeshua. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. If uh, actually, before I call the music team, if you have any questions or comments. Uh, oui, Rémi. Oui, je te remercie pour le message. Tu nous as parlé des forces et des faiblesses de David. Et puis tu as cité euh, Hébreu 11. Et puis au verset 32, ça dit, « Et que dirais-je encore, car le temps me manquerait pour parler de Gédéon ?» de Barak, de Samson, de Jephthé, de David, de Samuel et des prophètes. 
Donc, on pourrait encore 